good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to join me. Um, thank you for your time as we explore what a mark is biblically and we define the terms and um, we look at the characteristics of a beast and everything that's going on now this is the introduction and again i just want to say good morning good evening good afternoon wherever you're joining um, us all from god bless you and i pray that this this lesson this teaching this study blesses you because it's blessed me amen I started this study because there was an urgency um, in my spirit to get this thing out. Um, I have been quite consistently scribing the things that Holy Spirit has taken me, had taken the time to teach me um, for about a month and a half now, and I'm really grateful that He took the time out to teach me. The things that I'm I um, am talking about in this study are from your Bible. This is not a new doctrine. It's from your Bible and from um, the Bible dictionary and from other known resources. And so if there's any question about what's being taught here, please feel free to open up your Bible and read it and also go and research what is being said here. All right. And so with this, um, I want to say that this message may get a little tight towards the end, but I'll, I'll, I'm going to urge you to continue to listen to it to the end because it'll bless you. Don't allow your heart to become hardened at the information that is presented here, but instead ask God for the grace needed um, to uh, receive the message so that you can be better um, because we want you better and not bitter and it know that the strong man is like the bouncer at the door of the club and it's like a halt who goes there kind of thing when there's a word that comes in that's sent to penetrate your heart the strong man stands in the doorway to um to direct the traffic of the spirits that come in and go out. So ask God to give you the grace to be able to receive what is presented today. And this crisis or this, um, uh, let's see, this plague has gotten the attention of many um globally this is a global issue here um and we need to know that what's going on in the world is is um just a segue to what's going to happen with the beast who is um preparing himself a bride and so that he can sit on the th throne as well but we don't want to be the bride of the beast we are the bride of christ but this has gotten the attention of many and we need to know that going forward that our lives will never be as they were before i hear a lot of people saying oh when it goes back to normal or um when it goes back to things um the way things were before let me let you know that it is not ever going to go back to the way it was before um and we need to also know and be prepared for something that's going to hit right now. I believe that we're at a lull. 
period. This this time uh, is the calm before the storm. You see, the what we had before was just a dry run of things to come. Now, what's re- what they really want to do is about to hit. And so, what we need to do is we we need to prepare ourselves mentally and spiritually and even physically for what's about to hit so that we can be prepared because in this lull period it's to make us less alert and become comfortable so we are not sober and vigilant in in our in our um efforts and we become lazy and complacent and then we're not prepared for what's to hit but we must also always keep in mind that something bigger is coming and we need to be prepared for it um so you need to be prepared in praying in fasting in joining together with other believers assembling yourselves together it doesn't necessarily have to be in a church building because remember we are the temple of the holy spirit but we may not we must not forsake the assembling of ourselves together and we also need to prepare ourselves as we prepare ourselves with prayer and fasting we also need to prepare ourselves with our eating and so your eating is important also also i need to do that for myself um so we need to eat more fruits and vegetables so that you can get your mind right your mind to be thinking we need proper fuel for this this perfect machine that we have we don't want low grade fuel for the machine we need to have high grade um, fuel so lots of um, fruits and vegetables lots of water and if you eat meat lots of lean meats okay but know that something bigger is about to hit and we must be prepared for what's going to hit these are just a few of the resources that I used in this study. I used more, but I want to start you off with a, a few of them that you can use for yourself. You can use all of them, actually, but I just want to mention these. Uh, get a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance that will help you tremendously. Um, of course, you should have a study Bible. If you don't have one, there's you can there's always you know resources online that you can use. Uh, to help you get a vines complete expository dictionary that helps as well um, i also have uh, an ancient hebrew dictionary by jeff a benner which is excellent and i want to say that this was gifted to me um and he has a um, he has a lot of videos on YouTube that will help as well you in your studies. He's a Hebrew scholar. Um, get a copy of the Apocrypha in the Book of Enoch. That also helps um, for historical um, uh, content. And I, I know that a lot of people they're saying that you should probably be careful reading this because it's not inspired by God I beg to differ um, the book of Jasher the um, the uh, Apocrypha the book of Enoch these are all inspired texts in my own opinion especially the book of Jasher um, so these are books that you want to get uh, for your study as well get a copy of the dictionary of deities and demons um, um, in the Bible uh, for short it's called the DDD um, and if you're if, if you're just starting off and um, you want uh, to uh, you don't have any of these books there are, are copies of these online and this will help you uh, tremendously in your study you can go to uh, there's a site that I go to Eliya E-L-I-Y-A-H dot com it has the the different kinds of concordances on there and you can go to there's all kinds of study Bible um, websites and um, the Strong's Complete Expository Dictionary I believe that's on Eliya as well and Jeff A. Benner has a website that you can visit the Apocrypha, the Book of Enoch, the Book of Jasher, um, the DDD, they're all online and that those uh, will help you tremendously. And YouTube is a good resource also because they'll, there are people on there that will read these to you. Um, and and then not only will they read them, but there are even some versions where they um, allow you to have the words 
to read along with as you listen to them read it and so these are just some some study resources that can help you along if you're just getting uh, started in your Hebrew your deeper uh, Hebrew and Greek studies and you want to dig deeper into the Bible and no longer just have a surface level understanding of course we um we rely on holy spirit but he told us to study to show ourselves approve unto god a workman that needeth not be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth why not use tools that are available to us to help us in the study so that we can um, get a better understanding do a cultural study it will help you also word studies are excellent Um, but there are resources available to us in our studies so that we don't have to be ignorant because far too many of us read this book as a western book it is not first of all these people were um from the 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 eastern part of the world and it is an inspired text this text is inspired by god um but these people remember that these people are not uh, american and and this book is read from a greco-roman standpoint and these were not greco-roman people um i just want to say i'm to try not to make this too long um this portion too long uh, we read it like i said from a from a greco-roman standpoint and that's a more philosophical standpoint and this is where we get a lot of us get tripped up because hebrew studies they're they're functional we think we see we do we think we say we do i'm sorry um as a man thinketh in his heart so is he instead of saying hey this is a um why is this day you know i there's a study that i that i did recently um with one of my 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 prayer group and i wanted to just as an example to show the difference between um a hebrew study um of the bible or their verbs and how um, we americans or the west uh, reads the Bible. What do you think about um, a sunny day? How would you describe a sunny day? And you know, oh, it's beautiful outside, and da 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 da, and it's a beautiful day, and I can go out. Well, no, that's not what it says. Think functional. What does the sun do? Well, the sun gives warmth. The sun is hot, and so. Um, it's it's just more of a functional how does it relate to me and jeff a benner does a really excellent job at explaining um the differences between the greco-roman style of reading and understanding the bible and then the biblical hebrew style of reading and understanding the bible and so when we get into the text holy spirit will um open up so much more to you when you understand the culture as well so with all of that out of the way let's begin okay so something that i get quite frequently um is why do we even need to know all of this if you believe god and you pray and you um you love God why do you need to know just pray and believe and go on with your life well there's a few things um, if you just look at your screen that I want to touch on God Yah is our father and he's a good father and he loves us enough to warn us ahead of time I heard another pastor uh, say that he wouldn't have you um, like a, a blind boxer you know that's that's dangerous he's not going to just send you out and um ill-equipped to fight in this battle amongst just wolves he he makes you uh, equipped and he gives you knowledge ahead of time because he wants you to be equipped for what you're Sounds up right. against um paul said I-, I would not have you ignorant God that wouldn't have you ignorant. There's a scripture that says um, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, 
get wisdom. In all thy getting, get understanding. He wants you to know. Um, it also tells us to study, to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The word is our weapon, and he wants you to be skilled in your weapon. So when you're using it, um, it's not like a two-year-old with a machete. You need to be skilled in battle. He loves us enough to expose the covert actions and plans of the enemy. He, for some of us, he'll take us there to see. Um, and then you'll know ahead of so your job Sounds is right. to intercede. Um, and in some cases, warn the, the camp of what's going on. He loves us enough to give us time to prepare ourselves in the needful and necessary ways for battle. And he's doing a lot of that for a lot of people. He's given people dreams and visions of what's to come so that we're not ignorant and this doesn't catch us by surprise. He wants us to be prepared. Now, of course, you're you're here and it's gonna uh, these these events that are coming they're going to affect you in some way shape or form but you will be prepared because you knew ahead of time and there's grace for you to prepare and to warn those who will listen that they need to prepare also think noah sounds dry he doesn't want us ignorant um And I I want to say because there's this misconception that when you are um, warning people um, what God said or what's going on, that you're fear mongering and um, you don't really believe God and and all these other crazy kinds of things. But the Bible is full of warnings. He, it's a rallying of the troops. It's time for us to get ourselves together. No more ostrich um, believers sticking your head in the sand, uh, pretending that what's going to happen is not happening. This is a war. We are soldiers, and soldiers need warfare strategies, and soldiers are proactive, or they should be, not reactive. He is Our, our Father is not a haphazard, out-of-control God, and as His ambassadors and servants, we are required to operate as He does, with decency and and in order and so when we give warnings it's not to bring fear it's to prepare one another let's look at some definitions the first greek word is the word karagma for mark this is found in strong's concordance g5840 this denotes a stamp or to impress upon, or to add emphasis to, to emphasize. Another word is the Greek word stigma. This is found in Strong's Concordance, G4742. This is a tattooed mark, a burnt in mark, a brand, a prick, a scar, a negative name, word cur- curses like stupid or dumb or slow or retarded or lazy, things like that. Sometimes even siblings or parents ignorantly um, put stigmas on one another or their children um, without even knowing in their ignorance because we don't understand fully the power of words we use our words haphazardly and um, it becomes dangerous you're you're marking someone with with the sword of your of your lips uh, another word is epeco g1907 this is where we get the word epic and it means to hold to to observe or a monument the Hebrew word ot, H 
226. This is a distinguishing mark, a characteristic or sign. This is the ability to do or observe miracles, the ability to perform perform, I'm sorry, or observe holy or lying signs and wonders are marks. The the air markings or the mark of the the Antichrist uh, will be his ability to do signs and wonders. That's a mark. Um, prophecy and the fulfillment or lack thereof is a mark referred to Isaiah chapter 8 18 Romans 5 14 and Mark 13 4 for your references and signs or marks of the times signs in the heavens and knowledge of the times and seasons Genesis 1 14 a mark of prophecy the sons of Issachar were marked with the ability to know times and seasons. And so was the prophet Daniel. So I want to revisit the word stigma a little earlier in the study. We discussed what a stigma is, but for every Greek word there's a Hebrew equivalent so let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 37 and then we'll discuss um, and thou shalt become an astonishment a proverb and a byword among all the nations whither the Lord shall lead thee an example um, of this un an unfortunate example rather is for people of African descent is the n-word um, the n-word is known all over the world and it's a byword for people of African it's descent the Hebrew word byword is the word Shanina and this is found in Strong's Concordance H8148 and it means a sharp word a sharp cutting word to taunt or to jibe. I wasn't really sure what the word jibe mean meant. So I had to come to the good old internet and look to see what a jibe was. Well, jibes are in insulting remarks or marking remarks, a taunt. It's also um, it means to insult, to jeer at, to scoff, to sneer, and to mock. So let's look at a few synonyms for the word byword. It's, it means to be the object of ridicule, the object of criticism, the target of, the butt of, victim of, or victimized, marked, a scapegoat, the recipient of, the subject of, the focus of, the object of, a laughing stock, a mockery, to scorn, fair game, sitting duck, a fool, a pushover, a dupe, a patsy, prey, a chump. These are all negative words for byword. Now, of course, there are other synonyms for this word byword but in the context of Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 37 this these are the synonyms that would go with that word byword a mark is a name it denotes authority or character like the word melech which means ruler or authority it is to have the character of the image or likeness of Adam means earth I want to ask the question is part of the mark or do you think that part of the mark is to take man back to the garden where Adam fell and receive the nature of the serpent just something to think about I believe it is um, 
Adama means ground. Adam had to become as a beast and till the ground with toil. Another word for mark is slavery. Slavery is a mark. A mark is a function or a role, a replacement or a substitute, a stand or fill in, an alternate comforter, an incubator, as in like mom. Mom is an incubator, but it's a mark. You are marked as mom. A mark is a number. In terms of cargo, for example, a number is placed or marked on an object to denote ownership to ensure that the cargo is shipped to its correct place of origin. Again, think of slavery. It can also be considered a patent. A social security number is a kind of mark. A mark is an image. A mark is a title. A mark is a sign or a seal of authentication. It sets apart from counterfeits. It's the difference between a wife and a mistress. And in slang terms, they would call it a side chick. Um, and I feel like that's a degrading turn in it and of itself. It denotes settling for. It's the you will do for now wife and until I get back to my real one. And we are also marked by what we observed, observe. The Hebrew word shamar, H8104, is a covenant, Sabbaths, vows, circumcision, physical and of the heart, and keeping and guarding or the opposite oneself. And so it's what we observe in our heart is also a mark. So earlier in the presentation, we spoke about or um, we were discussing um, how a mark is also how you observe things. And I said that Babylon was their their ways, their customs, um, their practices. I want to show you something important, um, just you know, for information's sake, and so we know what part of being mark or the mark beast um, is. So um, their Babylonian practices here, but of what I want to uh, focus our attention on is the ancient Roman. Or Babylonian celebration of Janus. Now, um, if you're unfamiliar with Janus, well, Janus is a two-headed deity um, that looks back and looks forward at the pre at, from the previous year to the forward the um, the future year or the the forthcoming year, and um, they're with the divination. And this is the Roman New Year, also originally corresponded with the vernal equinox, but years of tampering with the solar calendar eventually saw the holiday established on its familiar day of January the 1st. And of course, this is going to be from an, um, well, from a, what do you call it, secular standpoint, not a religious standpoint, this is history.com. And so its um, its name derives the two faced demon <laughs> deity Janus, the god of of change and beginnings, and and so one of the things that they did, and if you go to Britannica dot com, it'll tell you that they chanted um, on January first, even prior to this. Um, uh, the practice um, in ancient Rome uh, was the worship of Marduk, and they would chant something um, in in the streets, and it would be something. It would look something like the um, Times Square in New York when the ball drops 
on January 1st. And so this is one of the markings of Babylon. Babylon is a mark. It's, it's, it's false god worship. And a lot of Christians don't even know that each time you wait for that ball to drop or you're, um, you're making your resolutions where you are giving or paying homage to demon uh, deities is high time for us to um, do inventory on ourselves. We need to take a long, hard look on ourselves um, and ask the question, in the current state that I am in, can I stand before God? Am I prepared to stand before God? And when you ask that question, do not be so quick to answer. Um, yes, I'm ready because it's not necessarily the case. Um, you need to examine yourselves. Um, the word of God tells us to examine our, ourselves to see if we are in the faith. And so we want to ask, um, do we look like God? Remember that Yah is righteous and he is holy only and he requires us to be righteous and holy as well so do we look like him does he see his blood on us does he see his mark does he see his name on us and so i just mentioned the words mark and name and so let's go into the word name what is name what is a name well in the hebrew it's Shem. In the Strong's Concordance, H8034, it defines Shem as, um, as an appellation or as a mark um, or a memorial of individuality. Um, and this is, um, it's used this way in Exodus 3, Exodus 3.15. And um, it's also honor, authority, um, and character. Shem is not limited to identification. It is also used for the purpose of reputation or fame. Um, Genesis 11.4 uses Shem for the purpose of making famous or reputation like provider, protector, healer, and so on. Um, and this Ezekiel uh, 29 uses it this way as well. Um, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 23, um, it does it it does it this way as well it's used in this way as well um it's it's also used to show reputation of fame um strength power or um like used in ezekiel 16 14 and second samuel 23 18 a name is a designation or a title like teacher or daddy or mommy um brother sister cousin teacher supervisor pastor deacon you get the point um so what is your name are you marked with the name of god or are you marked with the name of satan or the god of this world well this lesson or this study is meant to help us to do self-examination to see whose name we carry We are marked by who or what we honor and or worship. Teaching is marking someone. We are marked with the knowledge we received. To know intimately is a mark. Think consummation of a marriage. A mark is a name, a stamp, an impression, a signature, and a tattoo. This is the Hebrew word tab, H8427. Leviticus chapter 19 through, um, or I'm sorry, verse 28 says, do not put any marks in the flesh to the dead. This denotes a covenant, a binding and a yoking with, a blood covenant. Mark them that cause dissensions among you. This means to separate and to watch them. This is Romans 16, 17. The word mark 
in Romans 6 17 is the word scopeo g four six four eight scopeo and this means to look at to observe to take heed to and regard this is the verb form mark them watch them observe them take heed to what they're saying and doing regard them as look at them and not just looking at them you're looking at them intently discerning them and then uh, the word the the noun that's akin to that the verb scopeo is the word scopos which means a watcher a watchman you're marked with this title if you remember the definitions in um, earlier in the study you are marked by your title a mark in, in which to fix the eye and an aim uh, let's look at Ezekiel 317 it says son of man I have made thee a watchman that's a mark unto the house of Israel therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me it can mean one who sees monitors and observes or a marksman but how can you see watch or mark if your eye has been put out you'll understand what I'm asking as we go later on with testing and the eye a mark is a seal or a signet as a signet of a king the star of Molech Chemosh or the hexagram was the seal or mark of Solomon when he was acting as a magician I want um, everyone if you can just go and look that up um, look up the um, the seal of Solomon the, the star of Chemosh, the star of Kayun, the star of Molech, and a hexagram and see what you get. And also think of the name uh, or the seal or the mark on the forehead as we go along in the, the, uh, the lesson. This will make more sense to you later. I know there's so much on marks, um, but I just want to uh, kind of drive this point home um, to illustrate the different definitions and examples of a mark. Um, a mark, think of in, in terms of an ISBN number uh, for a book. Um, I just recently completed a book and an ISBN number is like a social security number for a book and it can be tracked um, um, it's a mark or a marker um, it holds a place um, I think on the old movies of a pirate and the pirates treasure X marks the spot um, it, it's the the Hebrew word arithmos and arithmeo um, that's the verb and it means um, it means something common, a company of a crowd, a multitude um, of people, uh, like to be counted in, it, um, to be numbered in. That's also a mark. I just want to take time, just a moment, to just make mention um, of the fact that the definitions that have been um, discussed up to this point will uh, will be visiting them again as we go along and, and along in the different parts so please um, take notes if you haven't been of the definitions and if you if you're not taking physical notes just mental uh, mental notes um, of the, the various definitions of what a mark is 
and of what we've discussed up to this point because everything will build upon this introduction video. So at this point, at this point, I'm pretty sure that there's somebody that's been watching up to this point and reading the scriptures and have said uh, to themselves or probably even to the video, wait a minute, that's not what I was taught. What are you saying here? Because I was always taught that you had to have the name of the, of the beast, the number of the beast and the image of the beast. But that's not what scripture says. At least one is a qualifier of being marked as a beast or like a beast. Please refer back to this is why I asked you to uh, remember the definitions because the definitions up to this point going forward will help you with the understanding of what we're reading in scripture. We're about to go into some grammar points. Let's talk about grammar. Conjunctions are words that bring together the parts of a sentence. When discussing or explaining conjunctions with my students, I, I tell them that it's like the glue that brings the two parts of the sentence together. Conjunctions can also negate the beginning part of the sentence or it can also affirm it. Let's look further. As I've already stated, um, conjunctions can either affirm or negate the, uh, the first part of the sentence. Um, these are some conjunctions that I want us to look at. And also we're going to look at scripture and hopefully this will help us to get a broader understanding of what we've been reading and have been taught for these many years and see see that what they've been we've been taught is error 
um, the conjunctions to look at are and, or, for, nor, but, yet, so, because, instead, you know, all of these. The word or in uh, the verse in Revelation that we just read is called a disjunctive conjunction. From the Longman Dictionary of Contemporary English, a disjunctive conjunction expresses a choice or opposition between two ideas. The word or in Revelation 13, 16 through 18 is the Greek word a. It's spelled with an e but pronounced with a long a sound. This is found or you can be ref it can be referenced in Strong's Concordance G2228. It means either, rather, than, or. Now with that said, let's look at it from a more practical and contemporary standpoint for a broader understanding of what the scripture is saying. Before we go into the contemporary um, examples that I'd like to show you, I want to note that it is my absolute intention to drive this point home until I get on your absolute nerve. And every time you look at a conjunction in a sentence, um, you remember my Sounds voice. Right. I want to drive this point home so that we can look at scripture and, and rightly divide it and go and look at definitions and not just um, look at it at a, from a surface uh, level standpoint, but look deeper into the meaning Sounds of right. the scripture. And so, yes, my intention is to get you to yell at this video enough already. I get it. So as I read through these lists of we do not, I want you to keep in mind how the book of Revelation and other scripture for that matter has been read, read over the years. And, um, and I want us to apply what we learned today so that we can uh, read the scripture with, um, with a different set of lenses. So let's, let's go into the grammar points. We do not use toothpaste or a toothbrush in which to brush our teeth. We do not use soap or water in which to bathe. We do not use deodorant or get dressed or comb our hair in order to ready ourselves for the day. We do not need a driver license or insurance or registration in order to operate a vehicle. We do not need a car or gas. We do not use the restroom or wipe or wash our hands. Neither do we brush our teeth or wash our faces. Because that sounds completely absurd, absurd and no one uses English or language this way. No one uses language that way. So then should not that same principle apply when reading scripture? Why don't we use grammar rules? I'm saying as a whole, I'm not saying that everybody doesn't um, because obviously there are some people out there who are applying the grammar rules and applying the, the, the historic rules. The Bible is a history book and um, applying the culture um, to scripture reading. But I'm saying as far as the mainstream church goes, a lot of us were taught um, the wrong things. We were taught that um, it's the name of the beast and, the, um, and his number and his image 
but that's not what it said. So let us read the same passage of scripture again, remembering that every word of Yah is written on purpose and with purpose. Pay attention to the conjunctions that we read. He wastes nothing. Yah wastes nothing. He doesn't waste words. He doesn't waste time um, or any resources that he provides. So let's read it again. So let's read it again, this time paying close attention to the conjunctions in the scripture. And it says, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name here is wisdom let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast for it is the number of a man and his number is six hundred three score and six so why did i say all of this um, these were this was um, an elaborate example to show that it's only necessary to f have one of the the qualities or characteristics fulfilled um, in scripture to qualify as um, or like or unto a beast I didn't add anything to nor did I take anything away from scripture I merely pointed out the grammatical rules that should be adhered to when reading scripture the conjunction or the Greek word a lets us know that a person can have at least one and or more of the characteristics listed in scripture to be qualified as unto a beast if the writer wanted us to have all of the qualities then i am sure that he would have used um, um the conjunction and to let us know that you needed to have all of these but he didn't use that he used or instead So now I want to look at verse 17 um, a little closer. And again, if the writer meant both buying and selling would be prohibited, it might have been written something like neither buy nor sell save he that have the mark. But scripture does not say that. We must look at context, culture, and grammar. Um, and so what it says is buy or sell not neither buy nor sell um i will try to come back to verse 18 at some point um, because there are some separate points that need to be pulled out from there but for for the purpose of this introduction video let's focus on um, verses 13 through 17. Hey, I, I bet you thought I was done with the grammar uh, points and, and picking grammar out of scripture, huh? Not a chance. <laughs> There's more. So let's go ahead and beat that dead horse, shall we? So scripture says that man was created in the image and likeness of Yah. So what is the image of the beast then? Hmm. Okay. So Genesis 1, 26 through 27. It says, then God said, let us make human beings in our image and likeness and let them rule, have dominion over the fish in the sea and the birds in the, in the sky, the heavens, over the tame animals, beasts, livestock, over all the earth and over all small, the small crawling animals on the earth. So God created human beings, man, the Hebrew, Adam can mean human beings, humankind, person, man, or the proper name, Adam, in his image, reflecting God's nature, character, and representing him in the world. In the image of God, he created them. He created male and female. This is from the expanded translation. Okay, so it does not say that God made man or woman. 
Abba did not command them to be fruitful or have dominion or subdue or multiply or replenish the earth. This is because he wants us to feel, fulfill all these, unlike Revelation 13, 16 through 17, that specifically only what specifies, I'm sorry, only one of the requirements needs to be met to achieve beast status. He said man and woman. Now, if he wanted to qualify um, the, the qualifier to replenish and multiply the earth would be to um, have man, a man or a woman, then it would have said or. But he used and because you need both. And he used or in Revelation to let us know that only one is a requirement. I hope that's clear. Revelation thirteen fourteen through 15 says, And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should speak, both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. The word image in these verses is the word icon. Icon found in Strong's G1504. This word means a representation from a prototype. It can mean a statute and or an idol. Um, it means bearing the resemblance of, as in the descendants of Adam bearing his image. It is derived or developed, it is a derived or a developed likeness. So it's a likeness over time, maybe learned. It's all, it also means the cognizance, the understanding or knowledge of the inward I. Vine, this is from, taken from the Vine's Complete Bible Dictionary um, that, that was mentioned earlier in the study. The root of icon is the Greek word iko, meaning a place. An image sits or dwells in or sits down in presides in a place. I want you to keep that in mind as we go into the ion and what the ion in is. An image or the image of the beast sits down in or tabernacles in the soul in on the altar of your heart or on, uh, let's see, on the altar or in the tabernacle in the secret place and so I want you to keep that in mind as we go in to the rest of the study it should get pretty interesting going forward
Adam's eye was single with Yah. The connection with Yah was there until he came into agreement with sin. He partook of the fruit of sin and his eye in his gaze was taken from connection with Yah, with the Most High. He then had die vision, two visions or double vision. His eye was then on another love, another lover. He was able to see something that he had never seen prior to his encounter with the serpent that was inhabited by Hasatan, nor was he ever meant to see what he saw. He came into agreement with something and his eye was opened to um, an area that should have it should have never been opened to. Yah wants our eyes to be single on him. He wants our gaze to be stayed on him. He wants our torches to be lit always. Um, we see in the Bible that it says your candle or your lamp, and that's not really a co correct rendering of the word because it should be um, your torch, not a candle. And in order to do that, we must meditate on his physical and written word, Jesus. Covenants are single. In the spirit realm, covenants are eternal. They're not meant to be temporary. Um, and so there's, Jesus said that you cannot serve two masters. You will either, either love one or hate the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot. He did not say that you should not or you mustn't. It's impossible to. Because that's division. You'll either love one and hate the other. A double-minded covenant is not a covenant at all. It's spiritual fornication or spiritual adultery. And this will make more sense. Just stay with me. Let's look at a couple of scriptures. Job said in Job 31, 1 through 4, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I look upon a maid? For what portion of God is there from above? And what inheritance of the Almighty from on high? Is not destruction to the wicked and a strange punishment to the workers of iniquity? Doth not he see my ways and count all my steps? James chapter 1 verses 5 through 8. It says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. The phrase double-minded is the Greek word disukos, disukos, and this is found in the Strong's Concordance G1374. The word di means twice. And the root word suke means soul. This is where the word psyche or psychosis or psycho is derived. It literally means two souls, di sukos. Suko also means cold. When the eye is no longer single, the soul becomes split. Adam literally gained a soul when he received sin in his body. God is echad, or this means one or whole. Division or division is confusion, and God does not operate in confusion. 
He is not the author of confusion. He establishes order. A split soul hears two voices. This is spiritual schizophrenia. God's sheep hear his voice only. This is why he wants us to be single in mind because a double-minded man is a two-souled man and that's hearing other voices when you should only hear the voice of the Good Shepherd. Singleness of mind or a single eye is the seal of God. When the eye is no longer single, then you are no longer sealed. Double-mindedness is a spirit of adultery and is legal grounds for God to divorce you according to the law. In the law, um, uh, I forgot where, uh, where exactly where it was. In the book of Jeremiah, it talks about how the law is the ritual of the law is performed of covenant. A covenant is between two part, at least two parties, and when they perform the covenant, they do a figure eight, and then they cut the animal in two, and the blood is collected. Now, when the um, when the covenant is made, uh, what they say to one another is, "May what was done to this animal be done to the one who violates or who." Um, comes out of agreement with the covenant who breaks this covenant and the um the animal is split it's cut off and so this in the spirit realm is divorcement when you are when you are in covenant with god with yah and you break covenant then legally there's grounds for divorcement this is why Jesus came back. He had, because um, the children of Israel broke covenant, now a new covenant needed to be established in blood so that he can come back and redeem his bride. Let's get into a biblical definition of an eye. According to the rendering of the word I in Exodus 13, 19, it means forehead. It says, and it shall be for a sign, a sign. Remember that a sign is a mark unto thee in thine hand and for a memorial between thine eyes. Remember that what you observe or, um, yeah, what you observe is a mark between the eyes that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth out of the abundance of the hearts the mouth speaks for with a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt I is the Hebrew word ayin so between thine eyes is in the forehead we're going somewhere In the ancient text or the Paleo-Hebrew text, written language was written in a pictograph form and the ayin was actually written or depicted as an eye. So in the natural, we have two eyes in which to see um, we see the physical realm things that that we can touch tangible things um, but then there is an unseen eye located in the forehead and this is used to perceive and to see into the spirit realm and up to this point I'm asking um, going forward actually don't turn me off just yet. Hear me out. I know this probably sounds like some new age um, witchcraft foolishness, um, 
about chakras and third eyes and other such nonsense but hear me out my aim is to provide you with straight biblical facts and references and not merely my own opinion according to the biblical resource the vines complete expository dictionary the iron is symbolic of seeing both in the natural and the supernatural the eyes may be used in gaining or seeking judgment in the sense of seeing intellectually making an, an evaluation or seeking an evaluation or proof of faithfulness in other words the iron is symbolic of or it's um, a representation of discernment it helps you to discern eyes are used figuratively of mental and spiritual abilities acts and states so the opening of the eyes in Genesis 3 5 means to become autonomous by setting standards of good and evil for oneself it represents morality The rendering of the word I in the book of Proverbs chapter 4 verse 25 is symbolic of morality. Another phrase from the eyes of may signify that a thing or matter is hidden from one's knowledge as in Numbers 513. And it says, and a man lie with her carnally and it be hid from the eyes of her husband and be kept closed and she be defiled and there be no witness against her neither she be taken with the manner in other words the iron represents unveiled or revealed knowledge this is revelation and this is given by holy spirit the eye is the window to the soul it can also be said that the iron is the doorway or the gateway or the portal or the matrix to the eternal judge or life the iron is the light of the body jesus is the light the eye is your spiritual monitor it is where what we in the natural know as dreams this is where dreams are derived but it is actually a spiritual monitor or window into the spirit realm as shown in the previous slide the iron the iron is the doorway or the gateway or the pathway or the communication with god and man just like it would have been in the garden of eden um, the book of Joel explains that dreams and visions will increase in the last days. This is where we are now. But what if the practicing, the practice of testing, um, this this um, plague testing, is a strategic plan to damage the eye, to keep people from seeing and perceiving, to knock off the direct communication direct communication with God and man from that part of the eye in the forehead the penal gland um, damaging it so that people cannot see clearly in the spirit because remember that it is responsible for morality it's your monitor your spiritual monitor it's responsible for discernment and this is how holy spirit communicates revelation think about that psalm 32 8 says i will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go i will guide you with my eye look at the picture here i found this on uh google and it's a picture of the pineal gland and the ancient Egyptians had complete knowledge 
of this gland. And look, they've drawn the eye of Horus around it. If you look at the next slide, you'll see how these, this testing is done. It, um, a doctor, doctors, I hope I'm saying this correctly, say that it um, breaks the blood barrier. I think that's what it's called. And it gets so this uh, the the abomination gets directly to the brain and also to the placenta. I heard a doctor say. So what if the people who are being tested regularly are having their eye not only damaged but put out, making them spiritually blind, opening up the door? For another to come and sit in on the altar because remember the eye is where sight is spiritual sight is derived it's an altar and it's a doorway so if you are blind you can't see who's coming in leaving that doorway open for another to come and sit in and tabernacle on the altar of your heart it is also uh, um it's a symbolic it's symbolic of a heart as well i i found these pictures also on google and i thought it was pretty interesting um how these tests are done look how far back they have to go i know someone personally who had it done and as she explained to me that they went in both nostrils and then um, down the throat and she could taste blood and my my question is why would you do that but I believe that this is done on purpose because um, it's it's almost like a sacrifice on the altar it's a defiling of the altar um, because the iron is the all is, is the altar um, and it's leaving the door open, as I previously stated, um, for the abomination of desolation for the altar. Remember that we are the tabernacle. We are the temple. Um, I know that some people are building a physical temple, but God is not bound to um, brick and mortar temples. He no longer wants bullocks and, and rams we are his tabernacle and his temple and um he's looking for a chaste bride so what if this testing practice is um just something to 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 snub out the eye to blind a person spiritually so the door can be open and what if the putting the eye out causes the area that that controls impulse is damage causing people to behave like brute beasts we'll get into this when we talk about the the whore's forehead in part two what if putting the eye out brings out the lower beast-like nature faster these are just something some things to think about as you look at this picture um, and see how the testing is done The word for doorway is the word pata. The heart or eye of man is depicted as a house or building and Hasatan is crouching at the door. The word or the noun pata found in Strong's Concordance H6607 means a doorway, an opening, an entrance and a gate. Um, Pata basically represents the opening through which one enters a building, a tent, a tower or fortress or city. Now, previously stated, the testing 
um, penetrates the blood brain barrier I think that's what it was well it's penetrated the fortress the barrier there of the city or um, the house the fortress the building you're you're considered a house um, in in scripture and so um, an example was Abraham was sitting at the doorway of his tent in the heat of the day when three heavenly visitors visitors appeared to him in Genesis 18 1 Genesis um, 38 14 um, the pata uh, may be translated as gateway Tamar sat in the gateway an open place thus a pata was both a place to sit a location and an opening for entry a passageway and the incense altar and his staves and the anointing oil and the sweet incense and the hanging for the door at the entering in of the tabernacle this is in Exodus 35 15 we've already spoken about this previously I hope you are connecting um, the docks there are a few notable special uses of pata. the word normally refers to a part of um, the intended construction plans of a dwelling housing or building but in Ezekiel 8 8 it represents an entrance not included in the original design of the building when I had digged in the wall behold a door this is clearly not a doorway the word may be used of a caves opening as well when as when Elijah heard the gentle blowing that signified the end of a violent natural phenomenon he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave although the basic meaning of pata is to open this is the verb form the word is extended to me to call Sounds right. to flow to offer for sale to conquer to surrender to draw a sword to solve a riddle and to free and it also means to deprive of. Guys, are we paying attention? Sounds right. Then you will do what? You will be like God. Every false religion is teaching you to be like God. It's what the new age is all about. It's getting you to pursue your godhood. Can I go deeper? I wasn't going to go here, but I'll help you. It's so deep, I had to think about it. <laughs> See, some of these false religions got to hope to some teaching. The teaching that they have, some of the teaching they have is, is, is true, but it comes from the other side. I mean, the, the, the knowledge that they, where they got the knowledge that was from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is Satan's domain or the occult. But the teaching is true. But Satan will take a true teaching like he did with Eve and trick us. He told Eve that if you eat of this tree, you ain't going to die. She didn't die. He told her the truth. But the, but the knowledge came. He took the truth and tricked her. So the knowledge they're getting from the occult or this other religions, these other spirits, remember Paul said that if you're going to receive another spirit, it's going to teach you some truth, but the truth is only going to be to deceive. Talk to me. So if you ever study, don't do it. If you weaken your mind, please don't start studying. Just stop. Just study Christ. Don't even study. But if you do study, if you, if you have any understanding that... Did you ever think, why did they exalt Hinduism in this nation? Why did they exalt that Eastern religion? Now, if you study Egyptology, you will find that that's the same religion. They have some of the same beliefs. 
If you study the comedics, you'll see it's the same beliefs. Study Buddhism, same beliefs. Are you there? If you want to know, they have some truth. One of the truths they have, I don't want to say it, because see, you can't tell people this, because see, people is, want to know. And they'll go study something they, they ain't ready to study, and then they end up lost. Say amen. You get, it, a lot of this stuff is hooks that Satan put out there to hook the curious. That's not content with knowing Christ, they want something else. What Satan has been doing is he's deceived us, and this is the reason why there are certain things in biology we were not taught. Talk to me. There are certain things we were not taught, but Satan's people were taught it, and they understand it, and we don't. He's been busy destroying what they, he's been busy destroying this knowledge in people that know God. But he's been giving his people this knowledge. This is the reason why in Hinduism, they start talking about chakras. In Egyptology, in the comedics, they, they talk about chakras too, these hotel cats, these conscious people. They have a right knowledge from a wrong place. Satan gave them the knowledge only to deceive them with it. In biology, you were never taught, really, about what the penile gland is. You do know in your brain, there is a small gland. And, 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 and what they tell you is that uh, this gland is your third eye. Now Jesus did allude to this. <laughs> he alluded to this when he said, if thy eye be single, which means Jesus understood that pineal gland. It, it's not evil to have one because we all got one. What, what evil is, is who controls it. <sighs> he didn't say if your eyes be single. Talking about the eye of the soul. We talking about in the brain. There's a there's a gland there. That if you listen, if you open it, you can open it. This is what Eve did. This is what Adam did. Before before they sinned, they were the Most High was communicating, and operating with them through this spiritual gland. It's the seed of the soul. It's there. But the occult took it and dumped everybody else down to it because if you got it, if you have it. And you if, if, listen. If you if, if if you operate out of that without the Holy Spirit, then Satan, just like what he gave to Eve, you'll begin to operate out of the dark side or the dark power. So this is what this is what these Hindus are trying to do. What are they trying to do? What are witches doing? They're trying to open this third eye. But if you open it, you can open it. But if you do. Without the Holy Ghost, demons will inhabit you. It is a doorway. You remember I told y'all for years that your natural mind is a blocker to the demonic. Just your natural mind will stop demonic stuff. Because you have been taught, not taught, you've been created with a barrier against the spirit world. And if you don't fidget with it, then you'll have a barrier. But if you open it, through what? Sin. Sin is what opens it. Oh, this is so deep. I can already see y'all got y'all. No, I ain't teaching no comedic switch. I ain't teaching that. I'm trying to tell y'all that Satan's people know. Everybody else is, he's calcified. In other words, he's trying to stop those that don't know God from receiving any spiritual messages. His people are operating because he's in control of it. But he's, but he's trying to, because everybody that don't know God, they will be led by the spirit of the world. I Meaning you'll just do what the world do. He ain't got to lead, he ain't got to do nothing to you. You're going to follow Nicki Minaj, you're going to follow Beyonce, you going to, them cats that he got, you're going to follow the idols and then you're going to hell because they going. He ain't got to do nothing to you. What he's afraid of are those that would know God. Now don't go studying this chakra stuff. Don't, please don't, it's demonic. I'm trying to tell you what it is. But I'm trying to tell you that when a person gets born again, I told y'all years ago that when you get born again, something physically happens in your body. 
Why do you think the mark of the beast is going to be in the forehead? This is why Christ said, listen, listen, if your eye be single, come on, let's, let's look that up. Can we look that up? Is this too much? I know I'm going to introduce the teaching to y'all now. show y'all that all of the all of the what what Satan, what Satan has done with his people is he has given them occult knowledge hidden knowledge which is say forbidden come on say forbidden that means knowledge that should not be had without let me see well, how I want to say this Christ is the mediator so, are y'all there Pata is not only a Hebrew word um, for gateway, it was also an Egyptian deity. Um, he was the deity of perverse truth, knowledge of self. Um, he was part of an unholy trinity. Um, I learned some time ago for even hip hop, um, a pastor um, from Long Beach uh, did a teaching on hip hop. Horus, Isis, Pata. Horus, Osiris, Pata. It's an opening. And um, his job is to open up knowledge or hidden knowledge. Um, the Egyptians have many gods, but Pata is said to be the eldest of them all. Sounds right he or it because i want to be quite disrespectful to these spirits it is the patriarch patriarch i'm sorry or the foundation he's a perverse father little g-o-d pata, pata is also spelled fata or fatha um p-h-t-h-a-h in Egyptian religion, the creator God and maker of things, a patron of craftsmen, especially cult sculptors, his high priest was called chief controller of craftsmen. The Greeks identified Pata as Hephaestus, I don't know, the Vulcan, Vulcan, um, the Vulcan grip, the Vulcan sign, which is very demonic. Um, it's a sign of a curse, the divine blacksmith the um the masons basically um and so we need to we need we really need to be studying mainstream church has really done a very poor job at equipping um the saints sounds right that the doorway or the gateway is the word pata in Hebrew. The ayin is also the heart. This can be referenced in uh, the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 5 through 8. The ayin is the throne of your heart. The ayin is an altar. The ayin is a portal, a doorway a gateway, a window, and an opening, a, or a matrix, an entranceway, whatever you want to call it. Why else do these other um, demonic Eastern religions um, desire to have you open your eye? It's making you become a gateway um, or a portal for demons. Let's see if you can figure something out. B. B is the bet, the bait, the tent, 
the tabernacle, the uh, the house in Hebrew. I, the I is the ayin. L, lamed. This is the gold um, to shepherd, to teach, um, to lead, to guide. Lamed, two lamed, lamed, lamed. Then we know that the gate or gateway is the opening, the door, the matrix, the window. It's the iron. We have gateway computers. There are um, windows programs. Are we seeing where we're going here? So Bill Gates, which I thought was thought was interesting. Um, He is leading people through another door. Um, He's a perverse kind of pastor teaching perverse uh, doctrine, um, leading people down another way. A gateway or a pata is also um, a word for way, but it's another way. And we'll discuss names and things once we get into the section on the assignments of world or U.S. leaders, for that matter. Interesting stuff, huh? Um, A wife should be the window or the eye or the the reflection and the glory of her husband. We, as children of the Most High, should be a reflection of of Jesus. Um, So we are to bind the word to our frontlets. This is what the word says. But why? Sounds dry. Yah will write his laws on our hearts. Since the ayin is symbolic of revelation and perception, Yah will write his laws on our hearts. This means that he will give us revelation of his word by his own spirit through our connection with a single eye. This is the covenant with him, not a double-minded relationship, but the single eye with him, a covenant. The single iron is covenant, and Adam had this connection with Yah until he hearkened to another voice. So let's read through Ezekiel chapter 9 through uh, 4 through 11. The iron is located in the forehead, and where this is where your, your desires and your affections are directed. It is also the signature or the name of someone. God, the beast, let's see, and the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub whereupon he was to the thresholds of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, go through the midst of of the city through the midst of Jerusalem and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said in mine hearing, go ye after him through the city and smite, let not your eye spare, neither have ye pity slay utterly old and young both maids and little children and women but come not near any man upon whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary then they began at the ancient men which were before the house and he said unto them defile the house and fill the courts with the slain go ye forth And they went forth and slew in the city. And it came to pass while they were slaying them. And I was left 
that I fell upon my face and cried and said, Ah, Lord God, wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel in thy pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem? Then said he unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great, and the land is full of blood, and the city full of perverseness. For they say, The Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth it not. And as for me also, mine eyes shall not spare, neither will I have pity. But I will recompense their way upon their head, and behold the man clothed with linen, which had the inkhorn by his side, reported the matter, saying, I have done as thou hast commanded me. I want to share something, a dream. Well, I, I, I won't say that it is a dream. That is not true. I was studying. I was up studying. And as I was studying, the Lord gave me a picture of a scale. Now, I knew it was the scale um, for balance in the spirit. One was righteousness and the other was iniquity it was sin the the scale was tipping where sin was and it had already it had almost reached a tipping point and it was about to pour out he impressed upon me that once that is poured out then judgment was to come on the land and so i knew i knew when i saw it that judgment was coming and so as I read this, I want you to keep in mind of the times that we're in. Do you have his mark set upon your forehead? In Ezekiel 9, 4 through 11, it spoke of um, the terms in the midst of the threshold of the house and in the midst of Jerusalem. In the midst of means the soul. It's in the midst of um, the garden. You're a garden. The soul. The threshold of the house. Well, this is the doorway or the gateway, an entranceway. And in the midst of Jerusalem is in the place of peace. We're bringing this presentation to a close, but I want to end the presentation by um, notifying you or letting you know that hell is an option. Enter the doorway and his name is Jesus while there's still time. The choice is yours. You don't have to be saved. You don't have to be a Christian to know that we are in the end of days. Anyone can see with eyes can plainly see that time is winding up. There's something amiss. There are lots of things going on. The world that we knew it is no longer. And so to, um, to get into the arc of safety, call on Jesus. Under the law of sin and death, the penalty for breaking the law is death, an eternal death in hell. John 12, 47 through 48 says, And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Will you go on another day rejecting Jesus? When we reject, when we reject Jesus, we receive the penalty of death that he died for. So we don't have to um, be put to an eternal death. He died for our sins. Why would you continue um, in your own way and receive death 
when it's when it doesn't have to be your choice. Hell is a choice. Will you choose Jesus today? Second Peter three, nine through 10 says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the element shall melt with fervent heat the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up choose jesus he doesn't want anybody to perish he extends his hand and he is extending it still will you grab his hand and receive the inner invitation for salvation First Timothy chapter two, verses one through seven in the Amplified says, first of all, then I urge that petitions, specific requests, prayers, intercessions, prayers for others, and thanksgivings be offered on behalf of all people for kings and all who are who are in positions of high authority so that we may live in a peaceful and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This kind of praying is good and acceptable and pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who wishes all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge and recognition of the divine truth. For there is only one God and only one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom a substitutionary sacrifice to atone for all the testimony given at the right and proper time. And for this matter, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying when I say this, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Adam and Eve attempted to cover their own sin and their own coverings were in com- were completely inadequate just as ours are inadequate they didn't realize that God is spirit and he sees beyond our natural coverings of sin we cannot cover our own sin they covered their sins and were banished from the garden forever your unconfessed sins will have you banished from eternal life and with him forever. It's eternal separation. First in hell and then the lake of fire, which is the final judgment. When you come into covenant with Jesus, you come under the law of grace. Grace covers sins, but unconfessed sin keeps you under the law of sin and death. And the wages or the payday for sin is eternal death. If you're ready to come under the grace of God by way of his son, Jesus, then say these words. Jesus, I realize that I'm a sinner and I'm in need of a savior. I repent of my sin and I call upon you right now to be Lord and Savior of my life. Jesus, save me. Amen. And if you've said that prayer, you are now in covenant with Jesus and you have you have asked him to save your life and you are now under his grace. Well, everyone, thank you so much for joining. Um, This concludes part one of What is a Mark? I urge you to stay tuned for part two. I thank you for your time. 
God bless you and I hope to see you again in the next video.